It's going out there. It's February 3rd. I'm Frank Curzio. It's the Wall Street and Plug Podcast, where I break down headlines and... Uh, tell you what's really moving these markets. I thought it hurts from saying ad now. So many podcasts a week. I feel like I'm saying it all the time. Anyway, it's interview Thursday. Got a great one set up for you right now. One of your favorites, who is Frank Holmes. Comes on every quarter or so, but he wanted to come on because he's got some great, great news. About a new ETF he's launching. And it's pretty exciting. Seriously, I don't say it often with ETFs, but it's even more exciting now after UPS incredible numbers. That would be very, very interesting. Seriously, I'd never really said that about an ETF. It's an exciting time. But Frank is a CEO and CIO of U.S. Global Investors, also executive chairman of Hive Technologies, one of the early Bitcoin miners. So he's going to break down Bitcoin, where the price is headed. So all over the place lately. How Hive is positioned to benefit more than its competitors in this industry when it comes to mining Bitcoin, Ethereum. And he's going to break down that new ETF his company just launched. Seriously, just launched this week. And let's get to that interview. Right now. Frank Holmes, thanks so much for joining us again on Wall Street Unplugged. Happy New Year, Frank. <laughs> happy New Year to you. Uh, I don't know if it's so happy for lots of investors. We've seen the market come down a lot. And I wanted to talk to you about that because you just launched an amazing product. We'll get to it in a minute. New York Stock Exchange, you know, a new ETF, uh, which is really exciting. And I'd like to get to crypto with you as well. But before we do that, let's talk about the overall markets here because – you're data driven. You look at you know, algos and use algos for your research and things like that. What are you seeing in this market where we obviously we saw a fundamental change, right? We saw that the Fed reverse costs pretty surprisingly, right, in November. But we know that risk, right? We're looking at four rate hikes. We know that they're going to stop buying bonds, like tapering and things like that. But just to see the market keep dragging on due to that risk and where we went down to. Uh, do you think it's overdone or, 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 hey, more leverage has to come out of this market and, uh, you know, maybe a little worried here? I, I think it, it's uh, it's pretty well done its course uh, at this stage. You know, the rates, will they go up? They're going to go up gradually, they say. Frank, it doesn't matter. Negative real interest rates are so big. It's just epic. Mm -hmm. uh, used cars are up 25% inflation. I did a piece in August 2020 about fake CPI, that if you use the algorithm in 1980, inflation was running at 9%. That same algorithm run today, inflation is at 14%. Wow. I know that my insurance for my house, my DNO insurance, I know uh, all these numbers are popped 23%. Healthcare insurance for my employees jumped 25%. So there is a lot of inflation in the system. And the only way to get that is to really get real interest rates positive. If that happens, we're talking about eight, nine percent money rate yields. You know that would that would really crush the market. And in a in a year for Congress, a gubernatorial election, mm -hmm. I, I I don't think all of that's actually going to happen. Uh, I think it's a lot of trying to talk down the markets because the Fed balance sheet is not shrinking like they said it was going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and even if you can borrow at a mortgage rate of, of 3%, it's still cheap money. So I, I think that uh, people are still able to borrow. Uh, and I think that that's the smarter way. The stock market is different. It's, it's discounting a recession six months out. Uh, and that's basically how it's functioning. And, and I think the other concern was the crackdown of how China operates. Uh, but I think now, all of a sudden now the panic of real estate crisis and a COVID crisis in China, that this worse is behind this. And now there's going to stimulate, they drop interest rates. That's interesting. They rose interest rates and now we're looking to raise them and they're dropping them. Uh, and that gives me a lot of comfort for commodity demand, which also cargo relates to why we launched C. All right, let's get into that, okay? Because I was going to ask you a little bit more about the Fed, but I want to ask you about C since it's relative to, to this because we saw Tesla come out with earnings last week and they were saying that, uh, you know, supply constraints. First time they said that. And yet you see all these EVs that are coming out. I get reports on this and you get reports on this. I get you know, pretty much real-time reports seeing how there's still, you know, major bottlenecks has gotten easier. But uh, how, what made you launch this? Because it seems like, you know, with this new ETF, Sky Cargo ETF, and I'll let you talk about it a little bit, it, it, cargo ships represent about 70% of the ETF, air freight companies represent about uh, roughly 30%.
with everything going on, supply chain issues, people wanting more information, I mean, you know, how did you come about actually launching this? Because I think the timing is absolutely perfect. Well, it reminds me of Jets. You know, why, I, why I launched Jets was I had to get in the ETF business, and I had noticed in 2013, my options for flying globally was shrinking, and the price of my tickets was doubling. And I said, well, there's got to be, you know, this is a booming business. Uh, and when I delved into it, uh, there was no ETF in the airlines industry, and airlines as all the subsets to it from Boeing, et cetera, uh, it, it, it employs something like uh, 8% of the population. So it has a big GDP factor. And it's also highly correlated to overall economic activity. So that led me to create my first ETF, Jets. And I had a quant approach to it. Uh, and then along came GoAU. Uh, it was the same thing for Go. It was a quant approach to beat the, the GDX and GDXJ. And GoAU has done that. So I'm happy that that discipline has worked. C is very similar because I really noticed with Hive as being the uh, interim uh, uh, CEO there, I'm buying all this equipment and moving stuff between China and uh, Sweden and Iceland and equipment. I saw those freight rates going up every month, every month. They doubled. They went up triple. They quadrupled. And, and I remember when we had the crisis of, of COVID in April of 2020, the busiest airport in the world was Alaska. Why was that? Because it was moving cargo and it was cargo for masks and gloves. So that's what has sort of helped me to dig, dig into this. What are the factors that mean that this is a sustainable business now? The, the, the shipping is going to continue to grow. And there's a, there's a confluence of several factors, Frank. One is this climate change initiative, a lot of these rules coming out of the UN push that a lot of the big tanks, if they had crude with sulfur or ugly crude, they like to call it from Venezuela, they could not go use ships to move cargo around the world. They had to use different, more expensive fuel, and they couldn't go into seaports. Well, as that time came on, those ships was just coming out of COVID. And a lot of ships could not move equipment. So now you had a shrinking supply of ships that were able to move around the world, but you had all this pent up demand. And, and that's what led me into saying, you know what, this is sustainable. The green movement globally, climate change initiatives globally, coupled with uh, when you shut down China and China consumes 50% of all the commodities in the world, well, that has a big impact on, on iron ore and has a big impact on a copper prices, et cetera. So we had these supply side restrictions. And then we have the pent up demand coming out of North America. Uh, it becomes this perfect storm. And there was no really true global cargo uh, uh, ETF. So 80% of all global cargo, cargo is shipped by ships. And the other 20% is airlines. What we found in our modeling is at this sweet spot, looking at down years, up years, up cycles, down cycles, was this 20, uh, sorry, 30, 70 split. Cargo airlines only. Uh, to give you a classic shipping hives, high GPU chips by airplanes, it's up tenfold in a year, tenfold. So you and, and that's definitely a big inflationary impact. So we think that this is going to continue to be inflationary. And we also know that technology of Asia and other places around the world, they've spent much more money on robotics than America has. So when you ship over to the U.S. and L.A., the process of taking off the containers and drop them onto trains and drop them onto trucks, that process is, has many more human beings involved. Whereas in Asia and other big ports in Europe, there is much more robotics involved. So that just basically says we're going to live with, with these airlines and these cargo ships with pricing power for the next three to five years. That gives you a secular cycle in an asset class. So one of the things I like about this, Frank, and I'll bring it back up, John, I was looking at the holdings is even when you go to top 10, top 15, you have Zim Integrated, Orient Overseas. A lot of people aren't going to hear, I mean, you know, Maersk, of course, but if you're looking, a lot of these are international companies. Even I think Matson's one of the, one of the few, 
but it provides an opportunity where there's a lot of great names on this list that maybe a lot of people didn't hear of, but they're very, very large. And they're not easy to buy as individual stocks as they're trading on other exchanges. I mean, that's got to be a huge positive, right? Just getting that kind of exposure. I like that personally, where it's not just FedEx, UPS, and and you know a couple of uh, the big guys in here that anyone can buy individually. Uh, and, and the cost, like it's very expensive for an American to go and try to buy a South Korean company or a Taiwanese shipping company. It's, mm-hmm. it's very, very expensive. So here you can do it all for 65 beeps. I mean, it's nothing. Yeah, it's cool. So getting back to the holdings here, and I love this part. I don't know if so many listeners like it. I love it because I love how you how you know your methodology behind this. What is some of the methodology like, you know, for some of these stocks making it to your portfolio? Because this is I know you, and maybe this is the first time they listen to you. So, but you've been doing this for maybe five to, years. Mm-hmm. So you can see that that we wanted to have a quant approach to who's the most liquid names. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was an important aspect, and okay. also who was the least expensive on enterprise value. Uh, and who had torquing revenue growth, revenue momentum. Uh, it, it's interesting to see that uh, one of the largest uh, Asian uh, shipping companies increased their base. They gave bonuses of 30-fold, not 3%, not 30%, 30-fold. So to make sure the workers are there and showing up and the big bonuses, you can only do that if you're very, very profitable. Uh, and so I think that these are all sort of the signs. Uh, and the last thing I want to share with the cost, there is an ETF or ETN that basically does forward shipping costs. It's a derivative of a, of a derivative. And if you want to buy something like that, you're not buying the real underlying business. Uh, you're paying a hundred and I think it's 70 basis points. It's very expensive. Uh, but it shows you the cargo for shipping running up, running down. But this is much more of a, to me, a stable business because it does capture what we cover in our global resources research every week, the, the, the pulse of demand for commodities globally and the shipment of final products. Uh, if you want to have an, your arm around growing PMI or shrinking PMI, uh, this particular uh, product allows you to deal with uh, the purchasing manufacturers index and future growth. And the supply side restrictions of we're seeing now in copper uh, are going to continue to grow. And so the shipment of copper and the pricing of that is going to grow with the green movement. So I think this is a very interesting, uh, unique uh, industry that's really embracing uh, a lower carbon footprint. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And guys, just uh, if you want to take a look at it, too, it's called a Sky Cargo ETF from U.S. Global. Uh, S uh, S E A is a symbol. Uh, yeah, congratulations on that. And I know because it's such a big deal because the last time you launched this, uh, an ETF, Go Gold, a few years ago, and you invited me, and I was able to go up there and ring the bell with you. It's still one of the greatest times, uh, you know, being at the New York Stock Exchange. We, we but, could do it, but no mask. <laughs> well, uh, what was that? Would you say? <laughs> we, we, we did not need a mask. <laughs> yeah, back then we didn't need a mask. I know, I know. And it, it's crazy. So when... Yeah, you know, let, let's let's look at gold because you know I'm going to ask you a simple question: Why isn't gold higher? Because we have negative real interest rates. I mean, we've been telling you know, that was the, the thesis for 20, 30, 40 years. Inflation, uncertainty. It seems like every it's checking off every single box. And I think people are surprised that we're not seeing you know 2,500, 2,200, and then you know we went to 1,800, pushing below there. But I think people think it should be a lot higher. Why is that? Why is it just is it Bitcoin taking away the thunder? But even at these conditions, they don't get better than this for gold. Uh, here's the interesting part. I saw all these reports coming out that the gold was down for the year. But if you looked at the average price, gold was up $80. Mm-hmm. So if you're a mining company, all you care about is your average sale. Not two points, two dates, that's all. The beginning mm-hmm. of the year, the end of the year, it was off 4%. And they defined the whole gold market as a bad investment on that, on that point. And if I go back the past 21 years, Gold has been up 87% of the time. The average price has been up 87% of the time. The gold mining stocks, they follow the price of gold, and they were down for the year. And that was, well, another shocker because 61% of them in our quant approach uh, have free cash flow. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I I think that, that A, the market is only looking at two price tags. They, They have great revenue. They're very profitable. Uh, and, and they're much cheaper than the S&P 500. 
Mm-hmm. So what does it drive? And there's a whole theory that there's this uh, conspiracy with the G7 countries. Uh, and I was always a big doubter of that and, and compression and oppression and suppression. Uh, you know, it sounds like uh, social politics, but there were there were charges made and convicted J.P. Morgan, Deutsche Bank traders of spoofing gold markets. Uh, and uh, J.P. Morgan recently wrote a big check to cover all those costs. Mm-hmm. So you know, maybe there's some rational reason. Uh, the G7 countries uh, were able to collaborate like a cartel and come up with a flat tax and all corporations. That's mm-hmm. unheard of. Companies always went from one state to the other because of better taxes. Uh, we went from one country to the next over better taxes. Mm-hmm. The whole boom of car manufacturing parts in Mexico and the NAFTA agreement is because labor was less expensive. So you traded off taxes and labor, and it was cheaper to do the assembly in the U.S., but do the manufacturing parts there. So all of a sudden, that's been taken away. Uh, and so is there collusion amongst the uh, the Janet Yellens of, uh, of the G7 countries? which includes Japan, which includes the EU. Uh, and, and that's the rhetoric you hear from the hardcore silver and gold bugs. And when you add up all these parts, it could be. Uh, all I know is that when it moves, it's going to be mega because these gold mining companies are making money, but we do have peak gold supply. So the only way for them to grow is to start doing the Pac-Man with each other and I spoke at the Institutional Gold Conference for just CEOs and portfolio managers, and I advocated to get younger investors into their stocks, and if, and you have free cash flow, stop selling your gold, hold it, be a believer, yeah. because a lot of the millennial investors want to go to things that they believe that you believe. Yep. They don't want to trust you, Frank, unless you also are eating your same food exactly. that you're trying to sell me. Good point. And and so the the crypto companies hold uh, the bulk of them hold their own coins, uh, and and we used to have I am Gold and Gold Corp. Uh, they used to back in the nineties hold gold because they had high grade, they had big free cash flow. Rob McEwen was biggest of that, and their stocks went to the highest relative premiums. So I think that's probably a lesson for the gold stocks, but I think they're really undervalued. And I think gold on a relative basis is one of those screaming assets because we saw every alternative asset class except for gold go up on those two points. But the average price did go up. Yeah. And and when it comes to those large cap gold stocks, even with the sell off and a lot of Russell and and crazy names, this is probably the cheapest sector I've ever seen producer wise. Right. Not not, you know, juniors. But I mean, these guys are trading at. Some of their lowest valuations growing faster than they've ever grown, much faster than SP 500 trading, much cheaper than SP 500, generating tons of free cash flow, spitting out dividends. I mean, they're in like perfect position right here to just to see that you're not, you know, I guess, you know, being patient and it could take a year or two, whatever it does as, as gold prices go higher. But it is interesting just to see that there's still, it's just a sector that I think people look at and like, oh, I don't want to go near gold. And I'm like, man, this is, you know, forget about if it's gold. If you took the word off of it, right, off of Newmont, change its name and just showed you the, the financials and the figures. People will buy the crap out of it because it's growing so fast, dividend paying, perfect for this market. And then they find out it's a gold company. They're like, yeah, I don't want it. <laughs> so like you said, the more I think more excitement and I, that's a really good idea. Holding, right? I mean, that that's a big point cool. where even when Bitcoin comes down, that's what you see all over Twitter. Hey, we're holding, 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 trust. HODL. Yeah. Right, right. I wore, coming back from uh, Europe earlier this year, going to see our facilities, my uh, Ethereum shirt. Mm-hmm. And I get the customs agent talking to me about crypto and what he likes and doesn't. And uh, now we're gold, buy gold, or I love gold. Forget it. They don't they ignore you, which mm-hmm. is really interesting. So I have this, I'm going to send you a hoodie, and it says hold gold. Mm-hmm. And I went to the Spurs basketball game. Now, mm-hmm. I never get young people give me high five, and I go up the stairs with my hold gold. And mm-hmm. kids don't see gold; they just see hodl, and they're giving me a high five. <laughs> I'm not a ball player, you know. It, it, it tells you something about this. It's, it's anecdotal, but it yeah. does tell you something that's going on uh, in in that sort of new world. And and I think that uh, and the crypto right now is going through its own sort of like 2018, where the EU and the G7 once again with the Bank of International Settlements is 
attacking the crypto industry. Uh, and you know what I think is there's just so much fun on how much electricity they use. It's now been well documented. It's 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 really not the truth. Um, China was the biggest of all crypto money in Bitcoin, and they were using uh, coal. That's all gone. So Texas has been a big beneficiary, and they're using solar energy, wind energy, uh, trapped natural gas. So I uh, I see this sort of sequence that the Senate's in, in, examining, investigating, the Department of Energy is, uh, the SEC is, like all the government agencies are piling on this industry, and they're doing the same thing in the EU. Today we got news that uh, the overreaching of uh, the the securities regulators saying crypto mining should be illegal. Um, but they're, a lot of it's private. It's not their business. But it's just interesting that this happened in 2018 uh, and, and sort of came in, in, in sort of a swarm like uh, hornets coming in. Mm-hmm. Um, but what they don't, what they really miss, and I think you get, and a lot of your listeners, is the gaming industry. What I have really learned about Ethereum mining is that the ecosystem is so big because you have all these gamers around the world, generation X, Y, and Z, and millennials. uh, It's a $200 billion business. They use their GPU chips at night. They go to bed, and they're mining Ethereum. Mm -hmm. The day one data point came up there, there's 20 million of them. Uh, Mm -hmm. I, I, I actually suspect there's more, and the reason for that is that it was looking at the number of gamers in the world. It's going to hit $2 billion in five years from now, or the $7 billion. The Chinese came back and said kids can only game for three hours a week uh, with their sort of centralized uh, draconian policies. Mm-hmm. Um, but they all need their GPU chips to do this. So what they do is they go mine in the cloud, and they can get one Ethereum a year. Last year, it was averaging you know, close to $4,000. I had as a kid a paper route to make extra money. These kids don't have paper roots. That's a die. That's an old business. They're all mining, mm-hmm. and and that is a big part of uh, what's happening around the world. Why is crypto so big in all mm-hmm. these places? Is because people my age don't get it that a lot of them are kids that were gamers, uh, computer designers, uh, architects, etc., that are mining as a hobby. For extra cash, yeah, it is incredible. Now they even play video games and and you know the pay for play model and stuff in, in Philippines. And I don't know if you saw those statistics where kids are playing all day because they're earning more money playing those games than they are, you know, working doing other jobs. But uh, you're one but of the few. Really good, though, but Frank, yeah. if you're really good gamer and you're in a sports and you're a competitive guy and you're really good at this stuff, you get rewarded in digital money in that software, yeah. in that gaming, and you don't have to write a check to be upgraded all the time. Mm-hmm. So it does create a, a sort of innovation and competition at another level that is to be an NCAA sport gaming. I mean, yeah. it, it's really you know interesting to see, hear these things and see it, but all of a sudden now we have this new Web 3.0 coming out and the metaverse, I think they said there's 18,000 coders working on this yeah ethereum has over thirty-three thousand around the world that are writing code they're writing based on the ethereum network they're writing for DeFi, for nfts for your favorite baseball card or how what if you want to have this so it, it's really moving quickly and i think the regulatory world is trying to catch up with their own digital money but you got to remember that these generation x y and z and millennials will have a vote and they're going to vote for the politicians that are going to be supporting their what they like to do. You know, I, I was going to say that you're one of the few people that I know that will talk about gold and within the same conversation five minutes later talk about DeFi and NFTs, which is awesome, right? Because I talked to some of these young kids too. We're in crypto. We have a security token as well. But to st- you've got thrown into this and talk about Hive Technologies because that, you know, big up and down, right? You see, 2018 was uh, terrible. Before, right before that, your launch was great, came back down. And then, you know, now you, you, you mining operations. Uh, I guess explain that. You just came out with your December numbers, which were very, very good. And, and, you know, explain Hive Technologies for maybe someone this is the first time they're listening to you. Well, we source only green energy in, in safe jurisdictions uh, where the weather's cold. 
we're in Canada, we're in Iceland, and we're in Sweden. Um, it's in, in jurisdictions where there's surplus energy. Uh, we have a very well-defined ESG strategy, like in northern Sweden, where we used our software to tool down from 20 megawatts to one in 15 seconds when everyone's putting in their toaster, then come back up uh, for the day and come down for an hour at five o'clock another peak energy consumption period. So we work with communities and we work with the local utility company, which saves them hundreds of millions of dollars of CapEx. So we look for surplus energy. We look for it has to be green. And then we work within those communities uh, to have a, a very sustainable strategy. And a lot of people tease us about Ethereum because of the, the thought process of proof of stake and proof of work and all this drama. All I can share with you, Frank, we source electricity in Sweden. We mine in the cloud. Uh, our wallets are in Switzerland and, and Liechtenstein, and we sell outside uh, of uh, uh, Sweden and all these. And we don't sell into Canada. We sell outside of that into cyberspace, um, and that was paying our electrical bills. What we started doing a year ago with our ATM was holding all our coins, uh, and Ethereum was up three hundred percent. That's a lot, you know, when you have 25,000 coins. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we started expanding our Bitcoin production. So we basically went from doing $50,000 a day in production to 500,000 a day. Uh, as you saw at the end of September, those numbers were out. We made for that quarter $50 million. Um, and now we're giving the equivalent that if we converted our Ethereum to Bitcoin, uh, we produced over 4,000. Uh, we're the we're the biggest and we're the most profitable because we mine Bitcoin if uh, based on Ethereum ratio it would be less than two thousand dollars a coin. So we're we have very high gross margins. Uh, and so we're very thrilled about that. And we continue to look for places to build energy that's green. Um, and that's that's what we're doing. And we're going to go to another exahash by Valentine's Day. That means that we'll be mining more Bitcoin, uh, even though it's more difficult to mine it. Uh, we're getting the latest equipment, most energy efficient, and then we'll have another exahash by the summer. So what does that mean? It means that we'll be doing a million dollars of revenue a day, a day, and having 80% uh, gross margins. Uh, and so I think it's a, it's a very dynamic business, but What's also important and that I have a long-term vision, our data centers that we own, like in New Brunswick, there is a push, and you can see it's not mm -hmm. mainstream, but data centers are becoming very valuable mm -hmm. because there's a push to get away from having all your data on Google, and maybe they're looking at your data, or having all your data uh, uh, at Microsoft or with Amazon. Uh, the most profitable part of Amazon's business is clearly – uh, cloud uh, contracts and selling you high performance commuting chips. Uh, you can li license by the hour. So we're building that out in Montreal, in New Brunswick, and in Sweden. That these chips that we have, they're the best chips in the world, allow us to get our money back in a year. And then we can turn around to sell the other people need for artificial intelligence for cancer research, or uh, it can be for rendering, making movies. Uh, it can be for smart cities or gaming industry or anything that's going into uh, streaming, G5, uh, 5G for streaming. Uh, this is all going to need these GPU chips, and the gaming industry is going to switch over that you're going to outsource having your, the GPU chip to data centers, which can make it very attractive for you to play cheaper. You just have to buy your headset, your console, and you can buy your headphones, but you're going to use the cloud and pay you know, $5 an hour when you want to play. Uh, and we'll have our HBC allowing you to do that gaming. I think that that's the big long-term vision, uh, what Hive. So that's why I want to own wherever we could our own land and own our own data center, get all our money back. And this business allows you to mine Ethereum if you have surplus time. If someone's not rendering, turn it on. Mine Ethereum, very profitable. Otherwise, the HPC market is even more profitable. Talk about, you said 80% margins. What is the price that is a break-even is break for you? And I remember back in 2017, 18, we went, 
went to, I think it was 19,000, wherever we went, close to 20,000 and high. But it came back down, and it came down hard to like seven, eight. And I, I was following miners, even if Riot and, and Marathon's one of the newer ones, I guess. But you know, seeing their costs were 7,500, 6,500. And as you get bigger and bigger, electricity costs cost more. You know, it's not the easiest business to scale, right? Because you have to pay more to generate more a lot of times. Uh, what is your break even cost? Uh, do you have that where, because, you know, people see a huge decline and, you know, a lot of these stocks get hit in your industry, but like you said, even at these levels, 80% profit margins, and, and maybe they're a little, little bit lower because maybe you talk about, you know, last year where it was a little bit higher, but you know, what is that price? Because it's always making money, it seems. And, and as long as it's over a certain price, what is that price? So when you buy these things, they sound like hair dryers. So they consuming, uh, blowing all this hot air mining and they're consuming 1400 watts that was sort of the old s9 they would call it for mining bitcoin the, ant miners, the, yeah. the new technology the new chips they're much more energy efficient mm -hmm. so therefore uh, you're into paying up front more for terahash they call it but mm -hmm. they're more energy they consume less electricity for giving you this output so when you try to create an xy do you remember back when you did functions relations mm -hmm. uh in school you have the X, Y, and Z axis, and course, you're yeah. trying to create a shape and the intercepts. So you have to think in this world, there are three big factors. And it reminds me also, when I model this stuff, it looks like you're doing Black Shoals three-dimensional modeling. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the factors that give you, a, that's going to move the value of an option around? And that model is based on heat diffusion. It's interesting. I don't know if you knew that, but Black Shoals is based on an industrial revolution mathematical model of heat dispersion. Uh, and, and so we look at what is the cost per terahash that you're paying for your chip. It's the most important factor mm -hmm. that tells you how many months does it take to get a return on your investor capital. Mm -hmm. We've had the discipline that it's best to have six months. And now, so we, the ASIC chips, we've stopped buying right now because they're a 14-month payback. It's too long for us. Mm -hmm. So we'd rather turn around and just mine and hold our coins uh, unless the equipment comes down. Uh, for us. So we, we do this trade off between it. The next is the cost of your electricity, your mm -hmm. ops, is an important factor. So the, the efficiency then of the chip you're using. So you're paying for the power of how many Bitcoins it can produce and how much energy it's consuming and the efficiency of that. So Hive is the most efficient of all the miners. That's a data point I'm very proud to share with you. Mm -hmm. uh, Marathon, Riot, right? if you look at the data analysis, you can see. And it's because of the blend of how we mine both Ethereum and Bitcoin and how we have low cost electricity. Last year, we paid two cents on average for that's green energy. Low. We hedged it out. This year is three cents in Sweden. So the costs in, in Canada uh, go up and up in the winter, and then they fall in the summer. Mm -hmm. um, but they're still overall the average like four cents. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so this efficiency coming back. The terahash is very important for your payback on your money and your ops. So right now, S9s are not going to be very profitable uh, at, at even three cents electricity. It, it, it's because the, the efficiency of these machines is just terrible compared to the S19s. And so it's, it, it, I think you're making $1,000 a day for us. My peers are using S19s might be making $1,000 a day, and on the S19, they're making 15000 a day. Mm -hmm. But if energy goes up one penny, they're losing on their S9s $1,000, $2,000 a day, mm -hmm. and they're only making 10000 So the S9s right now, unless you have free energy, are not, are not productive. They're just not productive. Wow. I mean, so outside of the, the hash rate, I, I think, you know, electricity is kind of a fixed cost, right? For, for most, I think. And, and so is, you know, again, you can look at, at the price of Bitcoin, but also, you know, the cost of the S miner, but you're buying it, right? So is it, you know, is it tougher? Because I, I don't know where that number is on Bitcoin, where, you know, like you said, there's so many, like, yeah, you know, there's, there's different components. And depending on what's going on, there are a lot of moving parts, but I know you know, because you model everything. Mm -hmm. So remember, it's the difficulty of the universe. Mm hmm. It's the cost you're paying a terahash mm -hmm. and your operating costs. They create an X, Y, and Z axis, and they're moving. They're not, it's not a linear square. Uh, they change their shape like a heat dispersion shape shows. 
And, and there are times when you want to actually just buy Bitcoin. You don't want to mine it because you're not going to get the payback in time. Uh, the, uh, it's an offset to get a high return investor capital. You can buy S19s. You can pay 100 bucks a terash if you want, and it's going to take you 15 months to get your money back. Uh, but you can do that with if you have a higher cost of energy, you still make money. But you're going to take a long period of time to get your money back. So th that's that's one factor. We at Hive are always triangulating it. Mm -hmm. We're looking for where's that sweet spot. Here's the difficulty. We run our computational math, and it gives us a heat map between orange and green. And we say, okay, we're willing to pay this a terahash, and we're the ops over here, and that's how we manage it. Three moving parts. So I'm going to ask you this question because this fascinates me. I'm really engulfed here. So hopefully uh, it, it, the listeners are as well. I may begin to hope I'm not here, boring but... your listeners. Yeah, uh, no, I don't it, think so because this is important, right? Because so was there a time when we saw Bitcoin? I mean, yeah, I won't take the absolute highs, which is close to 70K. But between like 45 and 55, where because of those factors at one point didn't mix. And we're talking about like a five, six, five month stretch maybe when, when that happened with 45 to 55,000 on Bitcoin, let's just say that Bitcoin, it just, the economics didn't work where you wouldn't make money as Bitcoin being that high, or is it just like, wow, Bitcoin, as soon as it breaks 50, it doesn't really matter. And no one's going to charge like 10 cents or 15 cents for the electricity as long as you don't go crazy on that. But was there a time when all three of those factors just didn't mix where you, and, you know, coupled with Bitcoin being over 45,000 when you're like, it doesn't make sense to mine. It doesn't make sense to mine it for your operating costs. And, um, it doesn't make it, that's a big part. Your operating costs are going to make that decision. Yeah. Like I said, some people are willing to make two years returns on their invested capital. Uh -huh. Our discipline's always been six months. Uh, that's why we have the highest returns on invested capital. There's, it doesn't yeah. happen because of it were, it's not luck. It's it's mathematically saying is, yeah. if I bought this thing today, based on the difficulty today, based on Bitcoin today, how long would it take to get my money back? And your money and every day, so, right? Every day. Wow. Every crazy. day. So if you're paying seventy dollars a terahash, you're you're going out a year and a half out now, pushing that. And so you better have really cheap electricity to weather that. Uh, if you have a higher cost of electricity, you'll still be marginally you'll be profitable with mm -hmm. Bitcoin where it's trading at today, but you run a risk. Um, and so we are always making these trade offs. Wow, that's great. That's awesome. By the way, you guys have, you know, you're talking about uh, mining 4,000 Bitcoin equivalent, but you're sitting on close to 1,800, I believe. I mean, you finished the year, they get 17. You know, you know, you know, in a way, we raised 100 million on an ATM. Uh, we bought, spent $100 million on new equipment. We hold all of our coins. And at the end of September, our holding of coins was up 12 fold from the previous year. I mean, that's a uh, Bitcoin, 100%, 1800 oh, at and, and all that money we raised, bought all this new equipment and expanded our, uh, to an exahash, mm -hmm. and we still were able to do that. So we tapped the capital markets uh, at $6 back in December, um, okay. and it was at, at a premium. We're the only company so far to do a financing at a premium. That's what you're supposed to do. And we have yeah. options free. Our options are very liquid for like, you know, guys that like to do cover writing because the premium is so high on Hive. So mm -hmm. there's lots of uh, retail brokers in there doing cover writing with it. Um, and so we we also got options. We're the fastest to get options traded uh, on the stock. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're pretty excited about, you know, how the company's positioned. But we have been, we're the least expensive right now on a relative basis. And I think it's because of this boogeyman alleged fear of proof of stake now for your listeners proof of work versus proof of stake proof of work is decentralized proof of stake is centralized so you earn an income on it but there's very few players that have the money to turn around to earn the income on it and the whole concept of bitcoin is to be decentralized mm -hmm. have transparency of of how much was traded, timestamp when the trade took place. It just doesn't tell you who the parties were, uh, because that's encrypted. But everyone can see all those trades, how much was traded, where it was traded, and when it was traded. That's triple entry accounting. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that it, it's really to me fascinating to see uh, how this proof of stake argument is such fun. 
It hasn't happened because the Ethereum network is so big and broad with all these gamers. Uh, and they would just destroy their ecosystem. Uh, there was a cannabis deal out there that had a token, proof of work. That's their, their validating a transaction. Then they went to proof of stake because it's supposed to be cheaper. Uh, and all of a sudden, the coin fell. Crypto went up. It didn't matter. The universe, the ecosystem. So I explain this in capital markets terms. One of the things that made Jeff such a big winner is that in our story, we found that there's a in this ecosystem of buyers, there were hedge fund traders that wanted to short American Airlines and wanted to hedge, so they went long jets. Then there was another group that said, these are GARP stocks like Bill Miller. These are the cheapest stocks out there, cheaper than trucks and trains, and uh, and this is the industry. So there was GARP investors. Then there's another community that are traders. Why? Because jets has big trading due to energy prices. Uh, the biggest cost they have is oil. The volatility of oil gets basically put into, into the income statement of these companies. And so they have great volatility. So the traders are short, long, long, in and out, trading off of energy. Uh, and then we have that investor that says uh, it's, it's a big part of the economy. They want to be basically long a big part of the economy. So you have this ecosystem. And, and what's interesting, the same thing with Hive, Hive's original investors were gold bugs. It became their proxy because they were reluctant to go open up on a crypto exchange, worried about being hacked. So, so Kai became the gold proxy for them. And by us hodling, it gave them a more defined proxy. Then come, came institutions, and our big investors was Fidelity. Fidelity gave us $100 million in the first quarter of 2017 to launch this vision. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's just recognizing the, the ecosystem of who's going to trade this particular stock or this particular ETF. Uh, and if you only have one retail group of people, then you really cannot get the big traction. You need to have a complete ecosystem. But the institutions will not come in unless there's minnows. Minnows basically have what they call price discovery. Yes, of course. And we saw the capital markets explode during COVID. Why? Because all these educated kids stuck at home, they can't travel, going with they all became day traders. This facilitated price discovery, and then big institutional money came in. Yeah, it's amazing how it's sometimes you see the other way around, right? With the institutions, the roadshows, the IPOs, but to see crypto being an area where these young investors get in and institutions are kind of late and still still getting in right now starting to hire across the across every major bank is is pretty cool right you don't really see that that kind of yeah, it's very very markets. cool but I, I think the big pivot last year was paypal you know paypal i can't buy my etfs on it i can't buy uh stock on it but i could buy bitcoin at one tenth of a, a fraction whatever mm -hmm. i want five hundred dollars of bitcoin two thousand dollars worth mm -hmm. and then it went up fivefold for all these millennials so they could buy fractions, it goes up fivefold, they peel off 20%, they buy a new TV. Mm -hmm. It's all, it's, it's, you don't have to go between your bank and your broker and open all those accounts and call and send money back and forth and all that stuff. It was seamless. Yes. So that really ushered in. And the other one was Robinhood. 20% mm -hmm. of Robinhood's financial yeah. success in that IPO was, came from crypto. Mm -hmm. and, and so it is a new world. But you need to have for the fund managers like we have from a couple of years ago, new rules came out on illiquid stocks and it became basically only those where they were traded every day and 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 the spread between the bid and the ask. So if you don't get a lot of trading between the bid and the ask, the spread widens. All of a sudden it goes into the basket of illiquids. Institutions don't want to have to go in front of their pension fund trustees and the SEC or any any auditor and say we have all these illiquid names. So in came all this price discovery. The minnows shrunk the bid and the ask. And all of a sudden, more institutional money was able to come in. It unlocked a lot of institutional money. Yeah. No, that's great. So listen, we're coming down to the last part of this interview. I find this fascinating. Again, some people might be too technical. They're just like, give me a crypto. It's going to work or whatever. But I wanted to ask you about... Uh, your forecast for Bitcoin over the next three years. Everyone's like, it was going 100,000. I said, I don't, I don't want your forecast where it's going to go in the next couple of months. But just seeing the institutions want to get in, seeing it's a trillion dollar market, seeing how much demand is out there, seeing that they're hiring people, it, it's here, it's integrated and everything. 
you know, where, where's your forecast? I mean, uh, over two to three years, you see it continually going up and, you know, some people want to go crazy and now it's hard to put forecasts on it. But, but how do you feel about overall, just, just Bitcoin here? I, it's, it's really difficult because of uh, the volatility and uh, the forces. You have global regulatory forces against the crypto world, just like 2018. And today it's just pent up. The more the more socialistic or more lefts or centralists, like China is the most severe as a communist dicta dictatorial nation, um, you get they just don't want it. Uh, and and the more uh, democratic and more uh, libertarian, uh, then there's we like to have this other decentralized asset class. Uh, right now in the world, it's really gold and cash. And then along comes a Bitcoin, which are, are decentralized. Uh, and, and I think the governments want to make sure there's no nefarious activity, uh, and which I think is great. Uh, and, and I do think there's some, it was what previous uh, head of the SEC did is chased all the uh, bad characters out that were doing pump and dump tokens. Uh, and, and they cleaned up Dodge. So I, I think that, that worked out well. Um, but I think that right now the forces are, if you read the paper, the EU, anti-crypto mining, it's all climate change. Uh, Canada's pr prime minister told the Canadians to get, this is the big reset. The World Economic Forum, they said that we should use COVID as the big, you know, great reset. Uh, it's for all their social agenda of, of equalities and et cetera, and, and centralized controls of all money. So I think what we're seeing is a mechanism that they want to control social media, uh, governments around the world, and they want to control money, m and &M, but they're not sweet candies you're chewing on now. And that's the force that can delay Bitcoin to 100,000. Uh, it, it's just recognizing this, but the other force is the adoption by uh, uh, big investment banks, mm -hmm. by uh uh, JP Morgan's of the world, and and I think it'll resolve itself that Bitcoin and Ethereum will trade higher. Just remember, it's a non-event on a 12-month period to double or fall 50%. Yeah, gold, it's it's 20%. It's five times greater volatility. So whenever I've been asked to forecast gold, if it's on money supply, gold should be at 7,000. Uh, if it's on volatility, uh, the gold prices should be up. At least twenty percent uh, is, is then it becomes as overbought one standard mm -hmm. deviation. Bitcoin is a hundred percent, so you do have to, you have to recognize. So when you ask me about three years out, for me it's going to be how many new uh, uh, mm -hmm. government policies come out against it that can slow down the adoption. I love it. But the but global, it's bigger than most governments. No, and that's a fair answer. And, and and you're right. You get it. The more data points, the more longer you go out. It's just making short term forecasts, and this could be dangerous as well. But if I use Metcalf's dumb, law, so. mm -hmm. if I use Metcalf's law, mm -hmm. and the adoption continues with the PayPal's of the world and Robin Hoods, and they go to Europe, etc., and other places, then it's easy to see a quarter million dollars in three years mm -hmm. from now. It, it's it's not hard. And uh, many companies going taking the Ethereum to get an income on proof of stake, they're shrinking the supply faster. And Ethereum could easily be twenty thousand dollars, so it, it's it's not unfathomable uh, to see that. But the biggest headwind is, are going to be government policies. And remember, we always say in our perspectives, government policies are precursor to change. So that's why we monitor it, or fiscal monetary policies mm -hmm. and real interest rates rising would hurt all asset classes. Yeah, great stuff. Great stuff. Great stuff. Love talking to you. So listen. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you, I know they can go to the website, and you also have something that's Frank Frank Talk, which I'll bring it up right now, which is awesome, which is which is your blog. But how can they get in touch with you if they want more information about your fund, your new fund, C, and things like that? How can they do that? Go to usfunds.com. Uh, there's the investor alert. There's Frank Talk, um, and uh, we write on a regular basis every week, and we have other special articles uh, to try to inform investors to make that balanced decision. Yeah, this is all great stuff. So just uh, and you guys do write a lot. It's not like once every three weeks or anything. You guys got a lot of stuff up there, a lot of content, a lot of great stuff. So I know I'm on that email list. So Frank, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for doing a nice long interview. I'll try to keep it short, but I'm just so interested in everything you have to say. So sometimes how, things go longer. Most important, Frank. How's the family? Everyone doing well? 
everyone doing well, everyone healthy. It's nice being in Florida and you're in Texas. It's 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 definitely really cool. Uh, and yeah, everything's great. And you, how's everything with you, your family, your business? Seems like everything's going well. All good. I'm very blessed. I'm blessed with my health. Don't get too big. Uh, I ran five days this morning. I'm 66. (laughs) So next month I turn 67. So I got to keep doing that running. And how much do you run a day? You have to tell everybody. Three miles. (laughs) That's great. Five (laughs) days. That's awesome. Remember, don't get too big or you're going to forget about guys like me, right? (laughs) Big with love, bro. You got it, Frank. Thanks so much for coming on. Talk to you soon, buddy. Take care. Bye. Hey, it's great stuff from Frank. Love having him on. Hopefully, we didn't bore you with ant miners and hash rates and things like that. <laughs> uh, you know, again, it is, it's not easy to follow along, but I think it's important just to understand a little bit more what Hive does. And if you're in crypto, you understand it well. But listen, the majority of people, 98%, 97% of this audience, uh, you know, it's learning. I'm still learning so much about different areas, different industries, different things, different technologies constantly. The innovation coming out of the sector is absolutely, it's insane. It's insane. You're seeing it in Metaverse. Look at Sandbox. Look at the Central Land. And crypto's been all over the place. If you're a crypto intelligence subscriber, definitely tune in. A lot of these things have gotten nailed, but we did take small positions. We've been adding little by little, which I told you that's how we, we had lots of losers in 2017, 18. Added to a lot of those positions, and some of those came 30x, 40x winners. It's going to be volatile. This is normal if you're not in crypto. You know when it's going to happen. It could be a 40% retracement, 50% retracement. This happens tons and tons of times. Every time it happens, even when we went to 40 to, you know, to 20, man, just time and time again, like every year and a half, basically, over the past five years. Uh, I remember 19,000, it went all the way to, I think the, the 3,500 was the low, 4,000, and then boom, rocketed higher, then it was just 60,000. Yeah, this is what happens. And you, you, know, you flush out a lot of BS, a lot of the margin. Now the institutions are really coming at this level. You're seeing lots and lots of that here and there from, from some of the biggest sources in the industry, institutions coming in. But uh, just really, really great stuff. Love getting that perspective. Uh, and getting excited for that ETF. That's cool. I mean, you're looking at, at the supply chain issues, right? All these supply chain issues are, are, are getting better for a lot of companies. Some of them are warning here and there. But you look at UPS, FedEx. I mean, just some of the names that are in that... ETF, SEAC, and uh, you're going to see those names. I mean, wow. If you're looking at a lot of those names in the supply chain, they are reporting massive profits, massive revenue, and almost every one of them, even though they're growing here with all the money put into the system and they have pricing power, that they're saying that we're still pretty far away from going back to that, you know, no bottleneck full capacity thing, which is crazy when you think about it with some of the numbers that these guys are putting up. It really is incredible. It just shows you when you cut costs and now your business clearly turned around, all this money, liquidity comes into the system, more people have more money than ever. You've seen shipping, everything uh, from chips and cars, technology. I mean, it is opening up. I tr- track these statistics. It's getting better and better each, pretty much started three months ago. It was finally getting better and better, but little, only a little bit better. Not like, holy shit, everything's open. This is great. No, some companies get it done. They found ways to get it done. They were creative. Apple's getting it done. A lot of other companies are getting it done. Uh, and some companies aren't. I mean, I'm surprised Tesla, F5, GE warned all the supply chain issues. I mean, Boeing warned, but said, hey, you know what? We're starting to ease up. China's going to be selling that 737 Max. You're seeing Boeing really start taking off off its lows right now. There's just some guys that are finally getting it done and others that, that are still struggling a little bit. But man, just to see the timing of this is actually really, really cool. It really is. I mean, these profits at all times are going to get bigger and bigger and better and better. And it's very, very interesting. Now, I want to... Leave you with this one note before we go. So U.S. Global Investors, and Frank doesn't know that I'm talking about this part, So, but just interesting. His company is publicly traded. Okay, that's U.S. Global Investors. Has over $4 billion assets under management. $4 billion, Generates $26 million in revenue over the past 12 months. Pays a 1.6% yield. Think about those numbers I just gave you. Okay, $4 billion asset under management. $26 million in sales. Pays a 1.6% yield. Hive Technologies have a little, you got the ETF set, that great ETF set has their third one launch. The other one is the largest airline. Uh, so, and then Go Gold, which is one of the best ETFs you could buy for gold uh, in terms of performance wise. It just focuses on big ones and has special metrics, which I covered with him in the past. But also, you know, that crypto focus with growth, right? So, what would you say the market cap of his company would be? Four billion assets under management, 26 million revenue past 12 months. 
Margins are over 35%, up 40% year over year. Operating revenue up 100% year over year. Again, launching more ETFs. Great platform for crypto, which, again, is a growth model through Hive and is a little crazy right now, but it is growth. And Frank has tons of great contacts in the industry. He speaks a lot of leading uh, conferences in, in, within crypto. But what do you think the market cap is? I'll give you like five seconds. Four, three, two, one. It's $85 million. That's it. That's the market cap of a stock. So the stock is down from 12 to 550. It's trading at three times earnings and has 4 billion assets in the management. So if you look at competitors like Wisdom Tree, again, these are the biggest guys. 2.6% return on assets, 2.6%. 7% return on equity and trades at 17 times earnings. Invesco, return on assets, 4%. Return on equity, 8%. That has a PE of around 10. 40% of Invesco's assets are in QQQ, the ETF, which is insane, constant fees. As an asset manager, your goal is just slightly beat your benchmark and you'll be in business forever and collect fees for the rest of your life. I get it. It's fine. Perfectly fine. Just beat the benchmark. Yet US Global, okay, when you look at return on assets at 2.6 for Wisdom Tree, 4% of Invesco, return on assets are over 50% for US Global. Return on equity, 7% for Wisdom Tree. 8% of Vesco, return on equity over 80%, U.S. Global. Wisdom Tree is trading at 17 times forward earnings. You have Invesco trading at close to 10 times earnings. And you have U.S. Global trading at three times earnings. Pretty insane when you think about it. Pretty insane. So I don't know what that company has to do, especially since asset managers have been taking off lately. Have you seen that trend? Private equity, all these guys, and even... You know, just across the board, you're seeing their stock prices really take off. A lot of money f flowing into these these names, these sectors, and these asset managers, and private all this stuff. Yet you're not really seeing it from U.S. Gold with 85 million dollar market cap. Man, I mean, getting four billion dollars in assets and paying what you could pay double the stock price for that, maybe 150 million. I mean, that seems pretty worth it to me. That's a pretty nice acquisition there. I'm just saying, with a little bit of a growth model. But man, these guys are getting it done. I mean, you're looking at, at the growth. And everything, and assets under management, and operating margins, raising their dividend. Pretty crazy, and sometimes you see those disconnects. Again, it's out of favor for some reason, I don't know, but I love what Frank's doing, and love having him on. I really do. I love having him on, going over everything, and hopefully I didn't bore you too much, and I know sometimes crypto guys are like, he doesn't know what he's talking about with Hive, and you know have different opinions and stuff, and again, it, that's fine. That's what we're here for, right? To get different opinions and then figure this stuff out uh, for ourselves, but you know, this is what we want. We want the back and forth and stuff, and it's cool. I just love Frank. I love that he always explains everything. I love looking at going through his methodology and him explaining that like, we're just not taking a stock and put in a portfolio. He goes over the whole entire process with algorithms and everything. It's really, really cool. Really, really cool. So guys, that's it for me. Our Curzio Equity Token, which I talked about last two podcasts, is going to be trading on T Zero platform next week. I'm going to let you know the exact date, so uh, you'll see that all over our website. We'll let everybody, if you're on our, our mailing list as well, a lot of you on, which we provide discounts for a lot of newsletters every now and then and stuff, and provide you know, a lot of stories that you might not be seeing. Our website, if you know, is, is totally redesigned, and it's redesigned where it's a place that you can go to every day where we have new, fresh content every single day. So we become more and more of a media company. That was the goal. It's not easy to do. But if you see the format and the layout and everything that we're doing now and posting stuff on TikTok and YouTube and, and Twitter, uh, you know, everything's really getting bigger and bigger. All the trends are moving in the right directions for us, which is awesome. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, just becoming a media company is, is a lot of fun right now. We're just starting to get a lot, a lot more people come to our website, even on a daily basis, because now that we have that content on there every single day. And really good original, fresh content, guys. Everybody is producing original content. It's going to challenge you. It's going to be research-based behind it. It's not going to be some bullshit opinion with no research behind it at all. You could disagree, not disagree, but I could tell you, even from the editors and everybody that's writing for us, uh, I enjoy the articles. I think it's original, and I do a ton of reading on other sites and everything else. Uh, and it's really, really cool. And you're seeing it. You're seeing those numbers really start to take off, so people going direct to our website. But we'll let you guys know when that token, when CEO token, Curzio is going to be trading. It's going to be trying, trying to the simple curve, C-U-R-Z, uh, next week. I'll let you know the exact date. For those of you who are subscribers to our products, definitely listen to Frankly Speaking because I'll probably know then, which is tomorrow of when exactly it's going to be trading. It could be Monday, Tuesday. I'll figure it out, but uh, it'll be everywhere and I'll let you guys know. So really, really exciting stuff. And questions or comments, if you're a current Curzio Equity Owners holder and again, going to that T-Zero platform or if you need help 
uh, signing up to T0. Again, it's absolutely free to go to T0. That's just the only way you could trade our token if you, if you want or not. Again, there are risks and everything. We're just getting lots of questions. And I want to address it if uh, anyone is interested in learning more. Just send us an email, frankcursorresearch.com or go to our site, Cursor Research, and there's links for Cursor Equity Owners. So guys, that's it for me. Always here for you. Questions, comments on anything, frankcursorresearch.com. Definitely send them if you're a subscriber. Frankly speaking, that's our podcast that's not on iTunes. You won't see it any place. We email it to you, and that's a special private podcast only for our subscribers. Much more detail, getting into a lot of things, even some of the holdings. Not all the holdings that everybody owns every newsletter, but that's only available to paid subscribers, that special podcast. So it's a very, very big benefit for subscribers. It doesn't matter if you're a subscriber to our lowest price product, which is Dollar Stock Club, maybe $4 a month. Or thousands of dollars from the best, uh, our biggest uh, products and high end products. But you have access to that, and we'll know a lot more and tell you everything about the token and exactly when it's trading tomorrow. So, really appreciate all the support, and I'll see you guys soon. Take care.